So you spoke something at IBM. I'm going to explain a bit why uh, little by little uh, we, we changed a few things uh, until we had changed so many things that we decided to uh, to call it a bit of a different sorter. So why uh, uh, did we did we change things? First, we needed modularization. And this is something that the Spike interface really captures well, is the fact that there is no reason why uh, pre-processing shouldn't be swapped, couldn't be swapped with a different grip registration uh, engine, for example, or with, with a different post-processing or with a different cluster. And this is what Spike interface uh, provides. Um, this is what we had to do at IBL for our very specific uh, NeuroPixel uh, 1.0 and NeuroPixel uh, 2 uh, pipeline. We decided to switch our pre-processing as I've shown. The second thing is that uh, for us, it was really important when operating at scale and to have some more quality outputs, quality control outputs, and especially intermediate quality control outputs. Some figures uh, of the drift registration, some figures of the, the pre-processing, uh, instead of operating as a black box, that we have something that we can look at if uh, things go wrong, because they will go wrong if you have many and many recordings. Uh, the last thing is that more about re running and rerunning at scale. This may not be relevant for here, but that's one of the reasons why we wanted to uh, to to change and to, uh, to to change a bit the sorting. If I try to sum up uh, how a sorter works and what we wanted to change, this this is more or less how it goes. At first, we have the pre-processing, and I went through this already with the raw data uh, checking. That's the first uh, step of the spike sorter. Then uh, this pre-processing, we go into a drift registration. One of the, the, the big plague of uh, neuropixel recordings is the electrode motion. Uh, makes it difficult to track a neuron across recording, and there are techniques to do this. And here we swapped the, uh, the original uh, by kilo sort with a dredge motion estimate, which is a, a technique that uh, has been developed in Columbia University, in the Paninsky lab. Um, then in the clustering, we kept the original clustering of uh, by kilo sort. Uh, we just uh, we just found a, a little bug where we didn't detect data at regular intervals, so we fixed this, and uh, we also fixed the default detection thresholds. I'm going to show some examples uh, of this. And at last, it's mainly going to be covered by uh, Chris uh, Longfield tomorrow. But uh, we, uh, we 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 created uh, some additional quality metrics on top of the one already used at uh, LM, and we uh, we did. Uh, uh, a better uh, cleaner waveform extraction. But this is going to be more clear, covered by Chris tomorrow. So I'm going to cover uh, the drift registration, the whitening stabilization, and a bit of the clustering. So the whitening stabilization, it's something that we don't know happens in a, in a spike sorter, but it's very important is the way we analyze the data. Uh, the, usually the, those uh, pattern recognition algorithm, they need data that is a z-score that has a variance of uh, one and a mean of zero. There are several ways to do it. The way that KiloSort uh, brand of algorithm does it is by whitening, which is called zero component analysis. I'm not going to go into the details, but I'm going to talk about the impact of this. The impact of uh, the, the whitening is that we compute a covariance matrix of the data. We try to estimate this covariance matrix, and then we inverse this covariance matrix so as to decorrelate the channels. And what happens is that if we start looking at the conditioning number of uh, of this matrix with the stability or how much energy, if you will, is on the diagonal, we can see that most of the recordings uh, stick at a very at a low uh, condition number here uh, on the single digits. But we have some recordings that are very high, up, and uh, uh, those recordings exhibit a very wrong spike sorting. And what happens here is that the, the data is transformed in a, in a catastrophic way by the spike sorter, and uh, we cannot detect any spike. So we have to uh, stabilize a bit this inverse. I'm going to, this is an example of, uh, of what happens here on the, the raw data after the destriping or the, the pre-processing. And if you do a straight whitening on this uh, data set, you end up with very noisy channels. As you can see, the spike sorting, the clustering algorithm is operating on this whitened data, and this is not ideal at all. So if you stabilize a bit the, the whitening, uh, you can see that uh, the, the, the spikes are collapsed a bit. Uh, that's what expected from the, the whitening algorithm. But it's a much more stable way to run the spike sorting. This allowed us to recover uh, maybe 10% of our recordings.
Another uh, thing I wanted to discuss is the drift registration. So here we can see in, uh, in the red, so we have raster plots uh, on the on the bottom, and we can see uh, the, the drift. And I'll show you the, the attention to the detected drift uh, motion here. And uh, what we can see here in red, uh, the original uh, algorithm did not fit this data set uh, in particular. And we have many more data sets where the, the drift was not going, uh, the drift correction was not tracking the actual drift on the data. So uh, we decided to implement the dredge uh, registration system, which is a, a non-rigid decentralized uh, registration. Uh, so for this, I encourage you to look at the, the reference. There is a paper about this. Uh, we put this into our spike sorting uh, instead of the, the, of the kilo sort uh, drift registration, but we still apply it in the same way uh, that by kilo sort applies the, the drift. So the outcome of this is we have a better drift tracking. If you can see the blue curve compared to the red curve here, we can track the fact that the top of the electrode here, uh, the, the, probably the brain has moved relative to the channels for the end of the recording. I'm going to discuss a bit now uh, clustering. Uh, so by looking at the raw data, and this is why I say it's important, we, someone called this at the, at the ABL, but a bit uh, later in the project, you start seeing that at regular intervals, we had a few milliseconds of missing data where there were no spike detection. So you can see all of the spikes are detected left and right, but not here. When we started looking at the occurrence of those events, uh, um, we try to count the number of occurrence of uh, those uh, blank uh, areas. And we saw that it was uh, it was related to the batch uh, length, to the kilosort batch length. So we had to fix this algorithm. This was a, a little bug in the CUDA kernel. It does not impact the decoding or the data in general, but it's the kind of bug once you, you see it, you have to fix it. Yeah, it's, uh, we cannot keep this in our algorithm. So we fixed the bug and we ran the spike sorting for uh, with, uh, with the fix of this. Uh, again, this is something that you see only by looking at raw data. This was not see, seen in the, in the spike trains. Another thing that we changed is the, the default detection threshold. So here I'm showing an example of a spike sorting. Uh, with our quality control metrics, we have only 8% of units uh, pass, uh, passing. Uh, they are shown in, in green, while the, 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 the spikes belonging to uh, units that don't uh, pass the quality control are in red. There are two ways to think about this thresholding is the amplitude, what is the minimal amplitude of a spike uh, that needs to have in order to go through the spike sorting algorithm. Um, if we lower too much the threshold, we get too much garbage into our spike sorter, and the spike sorter cannot uh, do its uh, its uh, its job. But uh, if we set the threshold too high, then the spike sorter does not find enough spikes to support the reconstruction of the clusters of the full cells themselves. And what we figured out is that uh, this is probably what happened because if we lower the threshold uh, here at uh, at a different level. We st still do, uh, we get many bad units, but we get more uh, good units, and especially more uh, spikes belonging to the good units. Well, as you can see before, this is the same data, different spike sorting with lower thresholding. So here, it's, a re it's really a matter of trial and error. The, the problem, I think, uh, is part of the future work, is that it's probable that those thresholds are region dependent. It's not the same if you're working in cortex than in, if you're working in the cerebellum. The optimal threshold may be different. The next thing I'm going to talk uh, very quickly, the way we we, uh, uh, we qualify the units. Uh, we do an automatic curation. Uh, at the scale of which we work, it's a bit easier than uh, doing the manual curation in Phi. Uh, so for this, we have uh, three metrics. We compute the amplitude of the of the units, the uh, refractory period, and something that is based on the distribution of amplitudes to make sure that the amplitudes are, are not cut. Chris is going to cover this uh, uh, at length tomorrow. It's just the bottom line of this uh, diagram is that we have more or less 13, 14 percent of the units that are passing. Next, I'm going to uh, to go over the what are the outputs of the spike sorter now, uh, and especially the quality control outputs. This will be part of the assignments. Um, we have put some uh, figures, some raw data metrics that I've shown before. Um, but we also have put some figures about the covariance matrix. So uh, we have put the covariance matrix heat map. And we have put a heat map of the, the diagonal part of the whitening matrix. 
this allows to see if there is an issue, and especially with the condition number, if this is um, higher than 50, it's, we probably have issues, and then this is something to be looked at. This is a data set to be looked at. Uh, we also have put the channel detected, uh, the bad channels and the uh, detected as a data set so that we can reuse the data set. If you do the assignments, you will see that you can reuse this data set. You will download this data set and reapply it before you, you apply pre-processing. Another output is uh, quite common. It's quite nice to have the, the drift uh, output and some uh, picture of the drift, to have a raster of the drift. So this is for a full session here. We have uh, the raster plot, which is the, um, the, uh, the amplitude uh, and the, the occurrence of the neurons here. And we can see we have motion on this probe. At the beginning, the probe seems to be moving, or the brain relative to the probe is moving. And we have an example of after registration on the bottom. This is a good way to see there is a big issue with the drift registration. Um, uh, since this was a, a black box before, it is hard to know that you have a problem with drift registration. Now it's possible by looking at those pictures. Another uh, uh, thing is nice to output the rasters, the good unit rasters and the bad unit rasters after, so that we can have a, a look. As I shown before, it's not it's necessary, but it's not sufficient means that uh, non-stationarity on a raster is not necessarily indicative of a problem with the raw data, but it's still a good practice to have a look at those rasters. At last, uh, it's really nice, but at the IBL, we had the, the, the bandwidth to, to, to do this, is to compute uh, the PSTHs relative, so, uh, relative to the task. And here, we could uh, have a thorough look at all of our recordings. So here, I, uh, if, if you want to, uh, to have a look at how this is done, you can visit this uh, website where we can measure the PSTHs uh, as a function of task events for many units. And uh, this is a good way to look at your data as well to make sure that it's sound and it makes sense. And this is almost uh, going towards the decoding. So what are the future di directions? So we want to, to, to we still improve the spike sorting. This is at, uh, as it is, but we still have a lot of avenues to improve. Um, this is not very relevant uh, to you. It's more relevant for us when we have many uh, insertions to run. Um, what we want to work on algorithm improvements to, uh, though is the drift uh, mitigation without interpolation. Uh, the problem here is that we we, uh, we apply the drift, we measure the drift and we apply it directly to the raw data using a special interpolation scheme, which is not necessarily ideal. Um, this is what Kilosort does. It's better than nothing, huh? but uh, there may be better ways by, uh, uh, by allowing the template to move. Uh, so it may be a different clustering algorithm. That's uh, that's an avenue we we try to, to to look at. Another avenue is to uh, try to output some uncertainties about the cluster assignments. Some uh, some spikes, it's really clear that they belong to a cluster. Some others, there is a bit of indecision. It would be nice to have a measurement of this, so uh, as a normal classifier would have. And the last thing is uh, how to handle the non-stationarity of the spike trains uh, beyond the drift itself. Right now, we try to account for the electrode motion, but more and more we see in our data sets and in other data sets that uh, the units, the amplitude uh, varies as a function of time, the waveform shapes as well, and how to account for this in the, in the clustering. In the very last thing, and this is uh, an effort to do with the, the tools such as spike interface, is how to benchmark, how to have objective comparison of the spike sorting of thresholdings of the parameters and uh, something that works on a wide range of recordings because as I've shown, uh, the regions may be very different uh, in terms of spikes of team. So this is what I'm leaving uh, you with. We, we had to change many bits and pieces of the of the spike sorter. A good way to implement them is, uh, is to reuse the IBL sort as, uh, as it is for NeuroPixel. Another good alternative is to use spike interface as uh, we are always trying to port uh, what we implement into spike interface. So that's also a good way to uh, use the model, the, the model, the modularity. At last, I would really like to thank uh, the neurophysiologists that collected the data. It's a titanic work. So it's uh, something that we try to acknowledge uh, all of uh, those people from many different labs as uh, Carolina is, uh, is quite. And I will thank you with this. And